In this video, we will look at changes in matter. It's important to recognize that any time matter changes, it involves a flow of energy, either energy flowing into the system or energy flowing out of the system. A process that increases the internal energy of a system is given the name endothermic. Energy flows from the surroundings into the system or is absorbed. A good example of this would be the frying of an egg, the cooking of a steak, really any cooking process in your kitchen is an endothermic chemical change. A process that decreases the internal energy of a system is given the name exothermic. Energy flows from the system into the surroundings. That is, energy is released. All combustion reactions and many other chemical changes are exothermic chemical changes. Matter can change in three different ways. It can be a physical change, chemical change, or nuclear change. A physical change is a change in the position of atoms or molecules relative to each other. A good example would be melting an ice cube. A chemical change involves the change in the arrangement of electrons in an atom or in a molecule. Once again, a chemical change could be cooking a steak or burning a candle. A nuclear change involves the change in the relative positions of baryonic particles in the nucleus, also known as protons and neutrons. A nuclear fusion or fission reaction would be an example of a nuclear change. Of the three natural processes to change matter, Physical changes involve the lowest energy change, or the lowest energy flow. Chemical changes tend to be much more energetic, and nuclear changes are the highest by far. In this course, we will deal primarily with the chemical changes, but let's look at the physical and the nuclear just to clear them out of the way. The most common example of a physical change is a phase change or a state change. These are by no means the only kind of physical change, but they are the most commonly discussed. Phase transitions occur when a flow of energy changes the arrangement of atoms or molecules. In the diagram below, the energy increases from left to right. The internal energy of a system will increase if it melts, boils, ionizes, or sublimates. That would be moving from left to right on the diagram. If you move from right to left on the diagram, the internal energy of the system decreases for any pure substance. That would involve deposition, deionizing, condensing, or freezing. Other physical changes could be as simple as ripping a piece of paper or picking up a suitcase and carrying it across the room. Those are in fact physical changes because you've changed the position of molecules or atoms relative to other molecules or atoms. Now let's look at nuclear changes. A nucleus can be changed in three different ways. Fusion, fission, and radiation. Fusion is the combining of two small nuclei to form one larger nucleus and usually some fragments. This usually involves extremely high energy. Examples would be our sun, and hydrogen bombs, which undergo the fusion between two hydrogen atoms. Some balanced fusion reactions include if carbon-13 fuses with nitrogen-14, it can produce aluminum-27. Note that the masses add up, 13 and 14 make 27. And the protonic charge adds up as well, 6 and 7 equals 13, therefore this is now aluminum. Deuterium, a form of hydrogen, can fuse with tritium, also a form of hydrogen, to produce helium-4 and a fast neutron. This is one of the processes that we have used in fusion bombs. The second way a nucleus can change is by fission, that is the splitting of a large nucleus into smaller fragments. This is often initiated by the capture of a slow neutron and forms at least two, but sometimes several daughter nuclei and other fragments. This is pretty high energy, and it's the energy we use to power our nuclear power plants and the uranium-powered bombs. 
An example of a balanced fission reaction would be plutonium-239 absorbing one neutron to temporarily become plutonium-240. That then splits into molybdenum-100 and tellurium-134 and kicks out six fast neutrons and a whole lot of energy. The fission reaction that we use in our nuclear power plants is uranium-235 absorbing a neutron temporarily becoming uranium-236 and in turn decomposing into krypton-90 and barium-144. This process expels two fast neutrons. It should be noted that when uranium-235 fizzes, there are many possible decays. This is just one of the examples. Once again, there are three different ways a nucleus can change. Fusion, the combining of two smaller nuclei to form a larger one, fission, the splitting of a large nucleus to form two daughter nuclei, or radiation, the expulsion of a particle from an unstable nucleus to form a more stable product. We're usually taught that there are three forms of nuclear radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma, but there are actually quite a few. There is also neutronic and positronic emissions, but let's look at the three most common. An alpha emission is actually a helium nucleus. It has a mass of four and a charge of plus two. So when radium-226 decays by alpha, it produces a radon-222, an alpha particle, and some energy. A beta emission is actually a fast electron being expelled from the nucleus. So when cesium-137 decays via beta, it produces a barium-137, a beta, and some energy. A gamma emission is simply the emission of high-energy light, or electromagnetic radiation. So it doesn't actually change the identity of the nucleus. If a nickel-60 emits a gamma, it's still a nickel-60, it's just a lower-energy nickel-60. So we often show that as a star as the reactant saying, this is a high-energy nickel nucleus. For a gamma emission, nickel-60 emits a gamma, produces nickel-60, gamma, and some energy. Of the three ways that a nucleus can change, radiation is the lowest energy, although it's still a lot of energy. Now that we have covered nuclear and physical changes, let's address chemical changes. There are actually many, many different ways that chemicals can change. Ultimately, it's some sort of rearrangement of electrons, sharing or transferring, but we like to categorize our reactions in several different ways. The first is synthesis. It's when two species react together to form a single product. The reverse of that is decomposition, when a single reactant breaks apart into forming two or more products. The third kind, Single replacement. This is when an element reacts with a compound to form a new compound and spits out one of those elements that was in the original compound. A double replacement. Two compounds exchange anions and cations to form two new ionic compounds. A subcategory of a double replacement is an acid-base reaction. When an acid, that is a compound containing H+, reacts with a base, a compound containing hydroxide, to produce a salt, which is simply an ionic compound, and water. The sixth category is combustion, and that's a reaction with molecular oxygen to form only oxides as products. It can be metallic combustion to make a metal oxide, or another example would be a hydrocarbon combustion, where something like propane reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, and water. Let's look at a few examples of those six categories. The first category is synthesis. That is two species reacting together to make a single species. In this case, we'll take two species in the elemental form, solid metallic magnesium and gaseous oxygen. They're going to react together to form solid magnesium oxide. This is both a synthesis and a metallic combustion reaction at the same time. It qualifies as both. 
Note that the product has completely different properties than the reactants. The reactants are metallic, shiny, malleable, while the product is white and chalky, brittle and powdery, magnesium oxide. The second example is a decomposition, the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Initially, the decomposition is very slow and boring until a manganese 4 oxide, MnO2, catalyst is added to the system. Now the evolution of oxygen is evident and very rapid. Testing the gas with a burning splint does not give a pop as it would be expected for a flammable gas such as hydrogen, so it's not that. It doesn't extinguish the flame, as would be expected with carbon dioxide, so it's reasonable to assume that the gas being produced is in fact oxygen gas, as the balanced equation would suggest. The third reaction, a single replacement, involves a reaction of solid metallic zinc with aqueous 6 molar hydrochloric acid. The reaction is immediate, vigorous, and it evolves a large volume of gas. The gas when tested produces a pop that suggests it is hydrogen gas that is being evolved. Although difficult to see, the evolution of hydrogen gas is rapid enough to support combustion in the neck of that Erlenmeyer flask, as evidenced by the ongoing flame. The fourth kind of reaction is called double replacement. That is, the reaction between two ionic compounds that exchange cations and anions to form two new ionic compounds, and it often takes place in the aqueous phase. In this example, I'm using aqueous copper 2 chloride, characterized by that blue copper 2 plus aqueous ion, and reacting it with the clear colorless sodium hydroxide solution. The two products of this reaction are pure table salt, which stays in solution because it's soluble, and the low solubility copper 2 hydroxide that forms a gelatinous precipitate, which does settle quite quickly. After a few moments, the suspension forms layers with a variety of blue colors in them. The fifth kind of reaction, acid-base reactions, involves a compound containing H+, and a second compound containing OH-. This produces salt and water. Unfortunately, for demonstration purposes, this is usually a clear colorless solution reacting with a clear colorless solution to make, well, a clear colorless solution. So unless a, an indicator of some sort is added to the system, it's a pretty boring demo. If you would like to see a demonstration of varying pH environments, take a look at my YouTube video on universal indicator. The final example of a chemical change is a combustion, that is a reaction of some material with oxygen to produce only oxides. For my combustion demonstrations, I've chosen three substances considered to be very safe, but when powdered and blown into the air, can be quite explosive. In my first two examples, I'm blowing sawdust into the Bunsen burner flame. Simple wood, but in the form of airborne dust, it can become explosive. Secondly, cornstarch, a simple hydrocarbon found in most kitchens, but when blown in the air, it can produce a pretty nice fireball. And finally, iron. Simple iron filings react very rapidly in the Bunsen burner flame to give some very distinctive square sparks and produce iron oxide. In all three cases, the sawdust, the cornstarch, and the iron, the products are oxides. If you enjoyed this video on changes in matter, please like, comment, subscribe to my channel, and tell your friends. Please note I have an additional video dealing exclusively with the six types complete with more balanced equations and demonstrations. Hope to see you soon in Chemist Corner.